Today, as you know, is Good Friday, the day when the church, the believers of Christ, come together to remember the horrific and the tragic and, and torturous death that Jesus experienced on this day. And you may have asked this question about this day before, but what about this is good? Why would we call such a torturous day Good Friday? What about Good Friday really is good? A handful of answers have been put forward to answer that question before. Some would say that it's a transformation of words, and what was once God's Friday is now Good Friday. Some might say that it's as simple as the idea that when Jesus dies on the cross, that it is for our good. Maybe the most prominent understanding is that it's just a play with synonyms, and that good and holy are synonyms, something that the church has done in its history before. And if that's our understanding, then that leads us today to believe that this thing that we are here for is Good Friday, Holy Friday, Set Apart Friday, or maybe even Special Friday. I don't know that we deserve anything special, holy, or set apart. At least I, I don't think that I deserve anything holy, special, or, or set apart. You may have heard someone say before that they wear many hats. That's a phrase that came out of the 1950s in which many professions required some kind of hat or, or headgear or head, headdresses were just more prominent at that time, you might say. And so people had all sorts of different hats. You might have your, your, your work hat and your home hat, your sun hat, whatever the case may be. Now we use that phrase to uh, express that one person can have a handful of different responsibilities. So we might say that you have your, your, uh, your work hat, you have your parent hat, you have whatever other kind of hat that you have. And today, on Good Friday, I think it's a day in which it's appropriate for us to reflect on the hats that we wear and how we wear those hats. See, one of the hats that I wear is my parent hat. I've got two little kids, and there's no hat that I like to wear more than my parent hat. Love all of the, the playtimes, the hugs, the giggles, all of those, those wonderful things. As much as I love wearing that parent hat, I, I don't know how good I am at wearing that parent hat. Really easily, I get frustrated. I get a, a short temper, become angry or upset about this thing or, or that thing. I know that when I wear my parent hat, a lot of times when I'm supposed to be looking at and engaging with my kids, instead I'm looking at and engaging with my phone instead. I don't know how good I am at wearing my parent hat. Another hat that I wear is my husband hat. I, I think that I've got the, the best wife in the world. Absolutely amazing. So blessed in so many different ways. We're so compatible. We once had a, an eight-hour road trip. Eight hours there, eight hours back. We never once in those 16 hours turned on the radio. That's how blessed I feel like I am to have the wife that I have. But I, I also have to admit that I'm not all that great at wearing my husband hat on many occasions. My wife does so much for our home, for our kids, for me, for our family, and oftentimes I don't know how to keep up. I don't know how to contribute. I'm not always very good at wearing that husband hat. Many of you recognize me as somebody who wears the pastor hat. It's a, it's a look that I feel like I'm still growing into a little bit. Uh, I feel really fulfilled when I wear my pastor's hat, but there's not a day where I put that hat on where it doesn't become brutally clear just how much I don't know about wearing my pastor's hat. So what kind of hats do you wear? What kind of hats do you have in your closet, in your wardrobe? In other words, we use this word vocation in the church. What are the positions that God has called you to, and how do you feel like you're doing with those? Do you feel like you know how to wear those hats? Do you feel like you wear those hats enough? Or are you feeling a little bit like me, where you're re uh, ready to admit that you don't always wear those hats as well as you should, or as often as you should? Now, that's a lot about me. And that's one question about you. And we're going to get back to my story and to yours. But the thing that we gather, the big story here today is not me or you, but it's 
Jesus and everything that he experiences this Holy Week. Holy Week, as we know, begins with, with Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem, and everybody's excited. There's excitement filling the air. They are excited that the king is coming. They're so excited that they're taking their, their coats off, and they're grabbing palm branches, and they're laying those things along the ground so that as the king rides into the city, he doesn't have to get his feet dirty. On Palm Sunday, Jesus is welcomed into Jerusalem as royalty. He's welcomed as the king. We move a couple days forward to what we celebrated yesterday on Maundy, Maundy Thursday, otherwise known as Command Thursday. On this day, Jesus gives two very notable commands. He gathers the disciples in the upper room and he washes their feet, something that a servant does. And he says, hey, the way that I have loved you, the way that I have served you, I give you this command. Go out into the world. Love people the way that I have loved you. Serve people the way that I have served you. After he does that, he gathers them around the table and he institutes the Lord's Supper. And when, when we do that, when we come for the Lord's Supper, we come together in the presence of each other, but also the presence of Christ himself and we receive his forgiveness. After Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, and after he washed the feet, he went out to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying. And he's praying so intensely that he's sweating, but he's not just sweating sweat, he's sweating his own blood. Can you imagine the intensity of a prayer that leads you to sweat your own blood? And while he's praying, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, is going off and making plans. Judas knows that Jesus is a threat to the government there. He knows that the, they're threatened by who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and the power and the following that Jesus is gaining. So Jesus goes to them and says, I know you're threatened, and if you want him, I'll tell you where you can find him. I'll lead you right to him. On Monday, Monday Thursday, that's what Judas does in that garden. He betrays Jesus. Jesus is then arrested. He's taken into custody. After Jesus is arrested, he goes into the night and into the early morning, and this is during the, the time of the Passover feast, where nothing like a trial is supposed to be taking place, yet the people want to get rid of Jesus quickly and quietly. So they have this secret trial in the night. Just Jesus against his accusers. Are the disciples there? No. Are the followers of Jesus there? Nope. Just Jesus and his accusers. And they come before him and they say, hey, we can't find anything wrong with Jesus. And even though they can't find anything wrong with him, he still receives punishment. He's whipped. A whipping at this time was a lot like taking a, a thin leather belt. And it wasn't just that that leather belt was kind of slapped against you. There was something sharp on the end of that, that whip. There's might have been a, a jagged rock or a stone or, or a piece of glass or a nail or something of, of those sorts. And it's not that the pain comes from when the nail or the rock or whatever it is makes contact with you. It's that it goes into your flesh and then it's pulled out. Jesus is found to be blameless, yet still punished. He's whipped. Then he's given a crown of thorns. They take a, a whole bunch of thorns and they, they put them together in this crown and they press it down on Jesus' head in order to mock him. Earlier, he's being called the king of the Jews and they say, if you really are a king, here's your crown. And they mock him with that crown of thorns. So he's whipped, he's beaten, he's, he's given the crown of thorns. He's going through this, this secret trial in which nobody can defend him and ultimately it leads him to to being crucified. That takes us here to Good Friday. After all of this, Jesus makes it to Good Friday, the day that he's going to go up on that cross. After all of this, Jesus has given his cross and said that he has to carry it to the place where he's going to hang on it and die on it. Understandably, Jesus can't do it. With everything that he has gone through for such a prolonged period of time, he doesn't have the strength to carry it. And so somebody is ordered to carry it for him. When they finally get to that place where Jesus is going to be crucified, they put him on the cross and they hang him there with 
nails. We all have nails in our home, I would guess. We're not talking about the little picture frame nails, the things that you use to put pictures on your drywall at home. Think of more of a a railway spike going both through his hands and then through his feet. He spends hours there on the cross hanging until he eventually dies. While Jesus is up on on the cross, he's mocked even more. They say to him, hey, Jesus, if you really are who you say you are, if you really are the Christ, if you really are the Son of God, why don't you just get down? Why don't you just come down and show us who you are? So why doesn't he? Jesus stays there because he knows that in order to show us, show them who he is, he doesn't do that by getting off the cross. He does that by staying on the cross. And when he stays on the cross, he's making a statement as to the extraordinary extent of the love that he has for his creation and the love that he has for his people. Now, you've probably heard lots of different ways in order to express love. Lots of different ways in order to say that you love someone or something. One of the really popular ways is to say, I love you to the moon and back. Raise your hand if you've ever had somebody say that to you, if you've said that to somebody else. Right? That, that expression is really popular. It comes from this, this book. It's a children's book. It's called, Guess How Much I Love You. Raise your hand if you've read this or if you have this at home. Right? This book was written back in like 1995 or so. And in this book, it has two characters. It has a, a male hair and a female hair. And I'm going to read you this book as we prepare to close out our time together. Then he lay down close by and whispered with a smile, I love you right up to the moon and back. If you came here with any doubt as to how good you are at anything or how good you are at things, if it makes you any more loved or or cherished or desired, today is our reminder of just how much Jesus loves you. When Jesus goes to the cross, Jesus is showing you exactly how much he loves you. It's not this much. It's not this much. It's not to the river. It's not to the field. He loves you all the way to the cross. He loves you all the way to the grave. And so this evening, as we hear this story, as we go through our readings, as we pray our prayers, let this evening be a reminder of the great lengths and the great depth that Jesus has for each and every one of you. So I invite you to go with me in prayer. Father, we thank you for the amazing gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. While we don't deserve it, you still give us your Son. While we deserve the punishment and the blame, Jesus takes it for us. Lord, on this day, we hope that you would send your Spirit to work in us to understand the great depth of love that you have for us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.